¿Hola? Hola, Santiago, ¿me escuchas? Thank you. And the Jung Professor of International Law at the University of Helsinki. She was a member of the International uh, of the United Nations International Law Commission and served as a special rapporteur for the topic protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict from 2017 to 2022. She is also a member of the Council of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law since 2019. She has formerly served inter alia as legal advisor to the Finnish UN mission in New York, as head of the unit for public international law, and as Finland's ambassador to Luxembourg. A uh, warm welcome to you, Dr. Leto. Then we have Michael Keating. Uh, Michael Keating is executive director at the European Institute of Peace, an independent body that works with a broad range of local and international actors including the European Union, European states and civil society, to design and deliver action on conflict prevention, resolution and mediation. Until late 2018, he served as a special representative of the Secretary General and head of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Somalia. Prior to that, he was an associate director at Chatham House in London, where he initiated a range of initiatives on topics including Afghanistan, natural resources and conflicts, access to energy for refugees and the displaced, and humanitarian engagement with non-state armed groups. Also a warm welcome to you, uh, Mr. Keating. Last but certainly not least is Erica Key. Dr. Key is director of Future Earth, US Global Hub, where she supports trans transdisciplinary research and works with a range of global partners on advancing sustainability science. Before joining Future Earth, she served as the executive director of the Belmont Forum, where she closely collaborated with Future Earth, most prominently in the Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress. She has also held a position as a program director at the US National Science Foundation and worked as an oceanographer at Columbia University, as well as visiting scientist at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. Before we hear more from the panelists, I would like to say a few words about Leiden University. And for this, I would like to do a quick dive into history, going back all the, year, the, way, all the way to the year 1574. And I promise that you will soon find out why this is relevant for this conference. In 1574, there was a major rebellion in the Netherlands against the Spanish occupation. The city of Leiden was loyal to the rebels and as a consequence was taken under siege by the Spanish in May, 1574. The city had almost no provisions and people were soon starving, but they did not surrender. William of Orange, leader of the rebel movement, was determined to liberate the city. And how was he going to do that? Here we come to the reason why I tell this story. He breached the dikes to allow the sea to flood the low-lying islands. Uh, the low-lying low land, uh, This allowed the rebels to set sail to Leiden. Um, after liberating the city on 3 October 1574, William of Orange decided to donate a university to Leiden to thank its population for their loyalty. 
Leiden University was founded in 1575. In other words, we owe our very existence to what we would now call weaponizing the environment. This anecdote, anecdote is actually more meaningful as it reflects the special relationship that the Dutch have with water and the sea in particular. It is our ally and our enemy. This special relationship is also one of the reasons for selecting water as a theme for this conference. Today, Leiden University is a university of two cities, Leiden and The Hague. The Hague is of strategic importance to the university for the very, very same reasons why it is so important that the third international conference on environmental peace building is held in this city. Not only is The Hague one of the main UN cities, it is first and foremost known for its connection to peace and justice. The 1899 and 1907 peace conferences were held here, and the building that hosts the Permanent Court of Arbitration and the International Court of Justice is called Peace Palace for a reason. The idea at the time was that specific settlement of disputes was a vital condition for peaceful relations between countries. And this is still true today. With the UN Security Council currently um, incapable of fulfilling its core mandates, the maintenance of international peace and security, we see that the International Court of Justice is increasingly ceased to adopt provision, provisional measures to prevent conflicts from escalating, while the International Criminal Court is called upon to ensure accountability for the commission of international crimes. So here we have the three elements that the Hague stands for, peace, justice, and accountability, hence why we selected this as another theme for this conference. Let me conclude my words of welcome with wishing you a fruitful and exciting conference. As the representative of the host, I would like to emphasize that Leiden University attaches great value to freedom of spirit, thought, and speech. This is expressed in our motto, which you may recognize if you look at the seal of the university, Libertatis Presidium, Bastion of Freedom. This motto not only symbolizes the importance of academic freedom, but it also reminds us that such freedom can only truly flourish if we give prominence to reason over emotions. I look forward to a rich and inspiring conference. These were my words of welcome. And now I would like to give the floor to Carl Brook for his opening remarks. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you. It's unbelievable. This we last gathered in person. Since we last gathered in person in Irvine, the association has more than doubled in size and geographic reach. We've created and launched Environment and Security, the only peer-reviewed journal dedicated to understanding the intersection of environment, conflict, and peace. We've accelerated learning and practice about how to manage the environment and natural resources for peace. Together, we are creating a new field of practice, a new field of research, and new ways of thinking. We are doing it through an active and an amazingly supportive, resilient community that brings together a wide range of disciplines, experiences, geographies, and cosmologies. The conference aims to connect you with others in the community, to inform you, to inspire you, and to reinvigorate you and reinforce your sense of mission. Toward that end, and with your help, 
we have assembled a diverse agenda of trainings, site visits, workshops, where people can collaborate toward a concrete end, panels, roundtables, posters, networking events, consultations, and skills building sessions. This is not your father's conference. Recognizing the power of art to engage, inform, and inspire, the Ampex Art Initiative, curated by Becca Barnum and Annika Erickson Pearson, brings you graphic, written, and performed contributions. We hope that you will engage, and we are thrilled to announce our second NPACS Arts Fellow, Austin Willisey. You will hear more from him later today. In addition to the numerous sessions, we are thrilled to showcase a series of exciting initiatives that advance the understanding and practice of environmental peace building. First, we have an oral history of environmental peace building. We are creating a field. We're coming at it from different disciplines and different perspectives. And we're trying to capture why and how that happened. Capture the stories that you cannot find in the journals or the books. And this is being co-produced by the MPACS Education Interest Group and the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. Thank you. The Education Interest Group is also seeking your assistance to identify educational resources. Please engage. We're celebrating the publication of a flagship report by UNEP and the Impacts Data Interest Group on digital technologies for environmental peace building, hoping that that will spur further discussion on how we can use a wide range of technologies and approaches to big data responsibly. The report, Planet on the Move, led by IUCNC, strives to synthesize our current understandings of the complex dynamics of migration, environmental change, and conflict for both humans and other species. And both of these initiatives were being brainstormed at the first conference. It sometimes takes a while. We get there and we do it in style. So please do engage in these reports. Yesterday, we launched a collaborative process to develop a glossary of terms and key concepts on environmental peace building that will help to consolidate the field. And following discussions and learning at the second conference, the toolkit on monitoring and evaluation of environmental peace building has been produced and published by ELI and the Monitoring and Evaluation Interest Group with support from the US Institute of Peace. This conference is the product of an extended and substantial commitment of many people and institutions. The scientific committee has shaped the themes and ensured the quality of the various sessions. The organizing committee tolerated me for a year. You deserve an award for that. Uh, seriously, though, it has been an amazing collaboration and refinement. I'd like to thank the Grotia Center for International Legal Studies at Leiden University for their amazing space. It's gorgeous. I love all the natural light. And for all the support throughout the conference. Our 16 sponsors have been indispensable to making the conference possible. And they're noted on the back of your program. And I'd like to take a moment for us to thank the Secretariat, who are amazingly talented. <laughs> and especially the seven core members who you see everywhere doing everything. Um, we are so grateful for your help. One thing I will note, some of us have orange lanyards. If you need help, if you're trying to find something, please ask. Finally, we want to thank you for taking the time and committing the resources and energy and effort to be here. This is only possible because you all are here. 
I want to close by reflecting for a moment. Every generation faces its moral tests. Poly crises abound. We are at a precipice that calls for all generations to stand for a just, sustainable system that upholds international human rights and good governance. Spaces such as this conference allow people to speak their values, to share their experiences, to learn and to be inspired. Through dialogue, exchange and connection, we can build understanding and only through understanding can we transform the conflict. Gathered here today are practitioners, policymakers, and researchers, and the next generation who have come together, who have dedicated their lives to building and sustaining peace. We've come together to share ways to foster conflict-sensitive development, justice for societies in conflict, and reconciliation in post-conflict communities. We will touch on many sensitive and painful topics. We need to show humility and respect, please. We need to listen, to contemplate, to empathize, and to seek understanding. For this gathering to be an example of the future we want to create, if we are to be models of the peace we wish to see in the world, then I ask all of us to demonstrate our capacity for dialogue, curiosity, and respect for all. Let us gather in a way that honors all participants and that fosters exchange, compassion, and peace. I wish you all an amazing conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, may I give the floor to uh, Dr. Nate? Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you to the organizers of the program for the kind of invitation that is to meet with part of the spoken panel. Good morning to everybody. I've been asked to tell you about uh, the international issues. There are three issues. It is the latest addition to the implementation of the legal framework uh, and the government for the protection of the environment in the public safety areas. Many of you know the crisis today, and some of you have been closely involved in the recovery of the crisis. But for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the crisis work, I think I should explain a little bit what they are about. The International Commission worked for the well, protection of the environment in relation to our politics, also known as HERA, from 2013 on, and completed it in 2022 by the adoption of 27 principles. This final outcome was then presented to the UN by uh, General Assembly. The relevant general assembly resolution welcomes the completion of the work and underlines the importance of the topic for international relations. The resolution also uh, brings the principles and commentaries to the attention of states, international organizations, and all who may be called upon to deal with the subject. And inhabits is their guiding forces of dissemination. This formulation, all those who may be called for, is in line with the broad scope of the broad personal scope of the crisis. They do not only focus on the obligations of the parties to armed conflict, but also seek to clarify the obligations of other 
non-governmental states, international organizations, or other actors may have, and what they could or should do to enhance environmental protection in relation to our governments. The principles address questions concerning the public responsibilities, obviously, but they also deal, for instance, with peace operations, uh, humanitarian assistance, protection of the lands and territories of indigenous peoples, and regulation of this. Another defining feature of the set of principles is its central scope, which has been entire life cycle that are called the time before, during, and after after, including situations of education. The general scope of the topic reflects the experience of modern conflicts, which, as we know, are mostly non international in nature, often with external interventions which support one or more parties. Such conflicts may not have a clear end, or may only end to ignite soon again, and the transition from war to peace. Maybe a long process. Some of the particular environmental challenges and opportunities of post conflict situations are taken into account in the principles. For instance, in the principles regarding the prevalence of war and peace processes. The general scope also derives uh, from the recognition and protection of the environment as continuous. And that preventive measures are likely to be more effective if they are taken before the conflict breaks out. The principles seek to contribute to better protection of the environment throughout the conflict cycle by providing measures to prevent, mitigate, and remediate environmental harm resulting from the animal. From the legal point of view, their purpose is also to contribute to a more coherent international legal framework for the protection of the environment In particular, for the integrity approach. Already, the broad temporal scope of the topic has made it necessary to go beyond the law of armed conflict. The principles draw on. Several elements of international law, in particular uh, international human rights law and international environment. Both of these areas are obviously primarily in the post conflict phases, but they also have a role to play during the conflict, including the impact of the situation. A further Feature worth mentioning is that the principles do not, in general, distinguish between international and non international conflicts. Some of them only apply in international armed conflicts, such as those relative to situations of occupation, but several principles use notions that include no state armed force. And some of them take into account that it has been a common a phenomenon in recent conflicts that non state armed groups exercise control of the territories. In addition, some principles are a relevance for non international armed conflicts, for instance, those related to illegal exploitation. Illegal exploitation of natural resources uh, and human displacement and their environment. Regarding finally the process in which the principles have been formulated, the principles and commentaries are the result of roughly a decade's work in the books. What I wish to highlight in this regard is that they were prepared very much in consultation with states, relevant international organizations, and other stakeholders. In accordance with its established procedures, the, the International Commission 
benefits from regular feedback from states, for instance, and this was also the case with the principles. As always happens, the finalization of the second principles was preceded by a consultation period during which states were invited to send in written comments in the draft case. This time, and given the nature of the topic, the invitation was also addressed to intergovernmental and other expert agencies. In addition, the commission's work on the topic, during the complicated course in the making, benefited from consultations with federal expert organizations, including the UN Environment Program, the UNESCO, the International Community Red Cross, with relevant and civil society organizations, and with the research community. Thanks to these consultations, the work on the topic was able to rely on the current understanding that the environmental consequences are uh, both direct and indirect. These consultations also served to ensure that the final product was not detached from the reality. <coughs> Since their adoption, the principles have been noticed and acknowledged by the states and institutions. For instance, by the latest UN Environmental Assembly, which adopted a resolution on environmental assistance and other areas affected by our quality, referring to the current principles. The principles have also led to further consideration of certain issues such as uh, designation of protective zones, which was a theme in the 2023 meeting of government elections from more than 140 states organized by Switzerland and the ICPC, or due diligence and liability of business enterprises, and even development of implementation projects as requested by the IDTM World Preservation Fund. So we have what I think is noteworthy in the current principles. If the broad coverage and the fact that they address a number of environmental issues that create uncertain conflicts. Together with the recent work of the International Committee of the Red Cross on IH implications to the environment, the principles clarify and expand upon temporal and thematically, the International Legal Framework for the Protection of the Environment for the Areas. And thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Dato, for sharing uh, this important work on the IOC principles, and I may be a bit biased I was involved in this consultation process, so uh, this, these principles are also dear to me. I think it's also an important call on us at the Environmental Peace Building Association to continue working on uh, bringing these principles forward to make sure that states are aware of them and implement them. And I know a number of us are currently already working on this, uh, but I think it's important to involve the broader membership, especially because, for example, evidence-based, um, we need we need empirical data also in relation to uh, to the law and to bring these principles forward. So this is a call also on everyone um, if you are interested in, in working on uh, providing implementation guidance to these principles. So let me now move to our uh, third panelist, uh, Michael Keating. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, let me begin by thanking you for the honor of being on this uh, opening panel. It is amazing to see so many of you in this room together to talk about this topic. It's such a force of encouragement. Uh, to to all of us and to to me that the idea that the world's 
environment and the climate on one hand, peace building and peacemaking on the other are coming together. It's very exciting. Congratulations to all of you who have been involved in bringing this together. I'm going to make a, a few points, so they'll be underpinned by three main points. Uh, I guess my first main point is that the data and understanding around the linkages between, on the one hand, climate change, environment degradation, biodiversity loss, and on the other hand, uh, conflict and violence, our understanding is going up. And I would like to think the legal uh, aspects of this are strengthened. However, the political will to do anything about this is at best very patchy and arguably decreasing right now. So we have a real problem. And you know, it would be terrible if our technical competence increases just with the political will to do something about it. Uh, Politics, if not uh, shrinks completely. And you see that most of all in failure to prevent and resolve any number of armed conflicts. The second uh, point I will make is that uh, we not only need to show how these, what these linkages are, both the negative uh, and the positive, uh, uh, and the positive in terms of using entry points to uh, create new forms of dialogue and conflict resolution and peace of them. Uh, but we also need to make the case for this work. And there are both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it obviously depends on which audience you're talking to in prioritizing one aspect. I suspect many of us in this room would prioritize justice and accountability and human rights uh, and so on. But actually, we also have to make a case on security grounds, uh, on economic grounds, uh, on grounds of health, uh, on grounds of human dignity, uh, uh, and I would argue on grounds of preventing further violence uh, and conflagration. And we're not as good as we need to be at doing it. And I think the third point that will underpin my remarks is the importance of multi party coalitions. And this kind of meeting uh, is very much uh, in that spirit and will help us form those. But they need to include uh, actors from all sections of society, including the private sector, including uh, you know, people in the uh, security space, uh, as well as international organizations and non-governmental organizations. And we, as the Institute of Peace, would very much like to contribute to those multi-party coalitions. So, um, I would need to tell you that the, um, how unpredictable uh, climate and indeed weather are becoming, but I would say that politics are also becoming unpredictable. Uh, and I don't think this is a total coincidence. I think these two things uh, are uh, connected. Uh, the number of conflicts around the world, alas, is going up. Uh, of course, Ukraine and the Middle East are top of mind, particularly here in Europe, but there are many other uh, conflicts, notably uh, in the Sudan, but also in many other parts uh, of Africa, such as Great Lakes and so on. Um, the number of people who are being affected by conflict and violence is going up pretty well everywhere. And this isn't deaths, so many deaths, it's also wounded. It's, it's people who are suffering tremendous mental uh, trauma. I think there are more people around the world living in situations of no peace, no war, places such as uh, Afghanistan and Syria, many other places which you can't really say are you know, at war, but you can't say for peace, they're living in common uh, insecurity. Humanitarian needs are going up, uh, 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 and uh, chronic and acute. Uh, and of course, we have the risk, uh, if not likelihood, of more conflict with a whole lot of very difficult fault lines, not least between the US uh, and China, uh, let alone 
uh, a growing divide, I think, between, as it were, the West uh, and many other parts of the world who have a very different narrative about what's going on and what needs to be done about it, and what needs to be done with the climate change. I would say that the nature of conflicts is also changing, and what we're seeing is both very old forms of conflict, like you know, people using machetes and tanks and trenches. Oh, okay. But also which I thought again. Uh, but also new forms of conflict, cyber warfare, drones, and all sorts of things. So we have a very uh, um, extraordinary uh, conflict landscape changing very fast. Uh, and while our understanding of the connection between, you know, climate and environmental degradation uh, and violent conflicts uh, are growing, um, and well, they have grown enormous. And that I think that is a big, a, a, a major achievement. The number of organisations and scientists that are uh, working on this has proliferated. Uh, I also think that knowledge of these issues from the perspective of those who are most directly affected has also increased, but we are not doing enough uh, to bring that into to play. But clearly, climate and environments have indirect effects exacerbating existing tensions in many societies, whether they're around a sense of injustice or exclusion or historic grievances, but they are also having an increasingly direct impacts. And of course, conflict is in turn affecting the climate change and environment uh, agenda. I think it is extracting resources and political attention from the climate change agenda. It is contributing directly uh, to emissions, uh, both in terms of you know use of military firepower, but also change economic relationships as a result of that. I mean, let's hope Green, the transition to green energy is some in some way the counterweight to that. But the dynamics between the two uh, I think are becoming increasingly evident. So in terms of the role of my organization, and we're a relatively small player, but I would like to think uh, where we are contributing to that transplant, thinking around the connections between the two. For me, you were kind enough to mention my role in Somalia. It was definitely Draw, drew upon that experience working with them, where it, it was very apparent to me as the UN guy on the spot that many of the problems that Somalia was facing, chronic and acute humanitarian needs, lack of investment in basic infrastructure, access to energy, the kind of rows going on between the central government and local government, disputes over you know, natural resources, control of security forces. All of these things actually had a natural resource and environment dimension on top of disputes that were specifically around water, land, so on, and things like that. So um, uh, I, I teamed up with many others, several of whom are in this room, to, uh, to develop something called a, a climate and environment peace making initiative. Uh, and we're now working. Uh, in a number of places. And basically, the idea is to use literacy about climate and environment and indeed energy, uh, an issue which possibly does not get enough uh, attention, as entry points uh, to, to, to put dialogue, uh, both in the context of preventing conflicts, uh, in terms of addressing disputes that are ongoing. And seeing if new ways of tackling them can be functioned by creating new fora for discussion, uh, as well as trying to enrich uh, and deepen the conversation about conflict uh, resolution and peace. And these things are all uh, over, over overdue. Um, uh, Carl, you've been very supportive of the work uh, we've been doing in. Ukraine, which is supporting the international working group, uh, looking at uh, the accountability, you know, look, looking at uh, the damage that's been caused by the war uh, on the environment, and also looking at accountability 
reconstruction issues. That's one part of it. But another really important part, and I'm conscious there isn't much time, is strengthening the voices of those who are most directly affected by uh, violence and climate change. And I do want to draw attention to the work we've been doing in Yemen, where over the last three or four years, uh, we have consulted something like 15,000 people initially, and then about 3,000 people to talk to them about what they consider to be the source of, uh, of insecurity for them and ways out of that insecurity. And it was amazing to find that the overwhelming popular support for environment, an environmentally informed approach to conflict resolution. That then begs the question, why is it happening? Why not be cutting through to elites, whether it's in Yemen itself or on the international stage about staging these things? Why is that not happening? And that's something that we need to, I think, address. And it goes back to my point about political arguments. We're also working in, in Somalia on a slightly different tack than I, I mentioned it, not so much to advertise how great we are, but just as an insight into another approach, which is essentially talking to officials about the significance of climate, resources, and environment to all the problems they face. So there's problems related to security or relate to constitutional reform, whether they relate to the economy, whether they relate to humanitarian issues. And increasing the literacy of officials and the politicians of these things seems to me absolutely fundamental. So if you can bring together evidence that people care about these things with a greater sense of ownership of these problems uh, in the countries which are most affected, that may be a very important building block in increasing political attention on these things. So, so let, let me end by, by um, uh, commending you uh, again. Uh, but I, I, I have to say that at the time when expenditures on defense, expenditures on humanitarian issues are going up, and expenditures on development and peace building, I think, are going down, and we certainly feel it. There is urgent in making this case uh, for all the reasons that we're going to discuss during this conference. And we would like to be part of your efforts and everybody's efforts, uh, not only on the technical side, but also in terms of mobilizing decision makers, especially in the countries and communities most affected, so that we can see a step change uh, in, uh, to our approach uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. also for providing the urgency of, of our work. Uh, you mentioned earlier also uh, green energy as a new opportunity. At the same time, we also see, of course, for the scramble for access to the very uh, rare minerals that are needed for the uh, energy transition. But it might in itself also uh, have an interest, well, uh, or an interesting is not the right words, but an important conflict dimension. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion that will uh, undoubtedly take place on, on that question. Um, may I invite uh, Dr. Key uh, for her opening remarks? And we have some issues with the interpreters and the table of mics. So may I ask you to uh, take the letter if that is. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, engage with you today in this um, epic global gathering. Uh, my name is Erica Key. I'm from Future Earth. Um, I'd like to see a show of hands of those in the room who have heard of Future Earth before. 
Excellent. That's great news. So um, at Future Earth, we are catalyzing informed, collaborative approaches to transformation for sustainability. That takes a lot of different shapes. So if you've ever um, accessed our website and said, not really sure what they do, we do a little bit of everything, actually. Um, we do what people need. And one of those things is mobilizing resources to support those transformations. And for the past 15 years, I've been working on radical collaborations to spur capital towards complex system change. Uh, this came from a background as an Arctic program director at the National Science Foundation. I feel as the countries come closer together at the poles, and you have this sort of seasonal remoteness and a um, sort of fluidity of boundaries that comes with migration and um, the historical extent of peoples, you know, you realize you have to work together. And it's not just about nations, it's about all of the sectors in multilateral, multi-sectoral um, impetus towards achieving a common goal. All of the funders that exist have different strengths and different mandates. So how do we link those together in such a way that we can appropriately address some of these complex challenges? Um, in this complexity wheel that I've shown here, I've added on top of the background areas where different funders can play a role and taken all together, we may actually complete this cycle of moving from a community need to an action. So in the area of developing those relationships with communities, that's something that many national funders are not able to support. Um, it takes a long time. It uh, requires uh, listening and support directly to community members, remunerating them for their time in the activity. That's an area where philanthropies and foundations have strengths. If we pass through into the problem solving uh, sector, we pick up other funders from private sector, science agencies, and ministries into mapping international and national NGOs, et cetera. And we complete the complexity wheel and we know that systems change. So there's never an end point. There's not a solution. There are options that we put on the table that uh, are a legacy that the community take up. If we did our work correctly, they have been there for the entirety of the activity and they then move that into um, implementation. So um, it takes this complex structure to actually achieve this transformative goal. Um, so how do we all work together when like some sciences and some transdisciplinary practices, funders often talk at each other or past each other because we have different vocabularies and different cultures. Philanthropies don't work and make decisions the same way that perhaps a national or regional funder does. So how do we build trust with one another in order to achieve something greater than we could on our own? One such platform that uh, I led for many years as executive director is the Belmont Forum. And it specifically addresses transnational, transdisciplinary approaches to global environmental change. This requires threading together of different knowledge types, at a minimum, natural and social sciences and humanities, together with a stakeholder that is sort of self-identified by the problem that is being addressed. Uh, as the Belmont Forum has grown, it has included health sciences, data and information, engineering, law, mathematics, and beyond. So it's really recognizing that it takes a holistic approach to be able to move something into um, that action space. The Belmont Forum addresses this um, through its 
plenary activity each year. I'm coming to you from Helsinki, Finland, where we just had the most recent plenary at the Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress. So at that plenary, members come forward and members are a resource organization in the globe. So there are currently 35 members that the Belmont Forum has worked with more than 200 resource providers on its funding calls. Uh, those members bring forward themes that are at the, this nexus. What actually requires a transdisciplinary approach? And it develops a coalition of partners that are willing to move it through what we call a scoping process. At the end of that process, a um, group of program coordinators have come together to actually put resources toward that activity, and then a call is launched. Why is that applicable to environmental peace building? Because in 2019 in Taipei, my colleague Hassan Birchi, uh, formerly of START, came forward with the then um, exceptional idea of addressing SDG 16. And couldn't we have a call that would bring together all of these resources on peace, justice, and strong institutions? The room was completely silent. The members were completely afraid. What is peace? What does that have to do with me? How do I measure it? How do I know if they were successful? This, you know, this was just too far afield of what they were used to funding, and they declined to move on ahead. Skip ahead uh, to 2022 and the experience of COVID, the experience of a pandemic, and we put forward instead of peace, environmental peace building, and they accepted and they agreed to move that forward into scoping. And the first scoping was actually held in Panama, which Carl was part of and provided um, a scope for us to begin a global process of learning. So here we are now in uh, 2024, still moving ahead, but with options, because what we've seen is that we're now at an inflection point where um, environmental peace building is gaining recognition both as a transdiscipline, I like to call it, um, and a global funding imperative. And so how do you be amounts um, a critical amount of resources to support environmental peace building projects moving forward. So through that scoping process, which is still ongoing, um, we've learned quite a bit. The scoping so far have taken place in Panama, Fiji, India, uh, the US, Geneva, uh, an African re uh, regional scoping, which is multilingual and virtual, but we hope to have in person um, in collaboration with the Environmental Peace Building Training Course and with the George Mason University Carter Center. And it just keeps moving. I feel instead of pulling people, I'm now being pushed from behind with this incredible wave of excitement. And um, we hope to continue that. So some of the outcomes that we've learned is that environmental peace building is still yet to resonate um, commonly. What is the definition? How are you, how are we um, how are we linking uh, environmental peace building with other disciplines and approaches to create that resonance that will develop a transdisciplinary team eligible for funds? So we stress the need for environmental peace building, colon, some more language to go here that explains what it is. Um, we'd like to create an accessible vocabulary. We heard that that is ongoing this week and forge links to existing funding programs. This is sort of assuaging that fear when they hear peace, but we put environment in front of it and somehow that makes it Okay, so linking that to existing funding programs through some sort of trust building process, demonstrate the ability to evaluate, measure, and communicate the impact, which now with the monitoring, evaluation, and learning uh, handbook that has been developed, um, we're a step closer to meeting that critical assessment goal. Um, connect practitioners, build networks. This came from our African event um, there's a lot of environmental peace building activity in Africa, 
but they're they're sort of individual lights in a tapestry and not as connected as they'd like to be. Foster belonging and exchange of lessons learned. Um, again, that's something that the handbook is helping with as well. Uh, there were a lot of requests from Oceania, from India, to connect with health systems, recognizing that things like a pandemic or waste management and health issues related to wealth management, I mean, waste management, um, are critical, and the role of religion that that is um, uh, very key, particularly in Africa, to addressing some of the conflicts. Expand the educational opportunities and encourage redundancies within the community so that you don't have a single point, especially in last mile communities, and that is particular to data. You don't want to put all of your um, uh, training and efforts into a single person who might be ill or might have to migrate or move off the island. Let's let's broaden that base. And, and lastly, to build language linkages with other conflict management um, studies and looking at the entire cycle, you know, pre, during, and post conflict. So uh, suggesting a disaster risk and pandemic examples as please. So um, I hope that this has given you a bit of a taste for what we're trying to accomplish here. And I hope that the next time that I'm able to address you is for the launch of a multinational funding call uh, with resources that can cover all of the different disciplines and um, community members involved. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Key, and it's inspiring to hear all the work that is done, and it's also um, uh, basically being developed, and I look very much forward, of course, to this multinational call. As a scholar, I'm always looking for funds to, <laughs> to uh, do research, so uh, very welcome. Um, so for the last 10 minutes of this session, we would like to do an interactive exercise with you. Um, and then I have to admit, this is the first time that I use Mentimeter. So I can't guarantee that it will actually work. But you see a QR code on this slide. If you scan it, then a number of questions should up here as soon as they go to the next one. I'm sorry, I, I just get very welcome and write something. Yeah, well, the first slide is, is, is basically an introduction slide, so there's no need to ask for a question there. But as I say, this is the very first time that I'm looking at the meter, so this is also <laughs> an experiment for me. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> Everyone was able to scan the code? Okay. Then I'm going to move to the next slide. And then hopefully you will receive a question. And that question is, how do you feel? <laughs> Sleepy, no <a> good one. <laughs> but excited in here. That's nice to see. <laughs> and I do have to, uh, I, I do admire everyone getting up early to be at this panel. So let me also thank you for uh, coming here this early today. Curious, hopeful, great. So I think excited is the big one, but curious is the most. Well, I think your curiosity, curiosity will definitely be uh, uh, satisfying, hopefully, at the end of this conference. Okay. Shall I go to the next question? Where did you travel from? And it can, of course, be your home country or then it's the region where you are from, but maybe you are actually uh, currently traveling all around. Uh, it's a terrible country, not the very 
Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I should have said more than American. Yeah. So you guys. Yeah. Very kind of. Other things. That's that's the thing. You went by American. <laughs> Okay, I've seen an influence that the majority is from Europe. Uh, it makes sense, but I don't think you just see that, uh, except for Oceania, there isn't from Canada. Uh, well, oh, <laughs> Okay, so I do want to go now that he's very near Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see that in the middle of the morning. Who's going to Anything else that is missing? <laughs> um, what field are you working in? And then I'm talking about uh, substantive fields, so geography or history or anthropology or Canada. <laughs> These buildings make sense. Okay. We have geography, conservation, and peace building at the winners, I think. Oh, no, it's just okay. Let's do this one. As a boy. Lonely, has a very small political ecology. Nice mix. Okay. It's not like actually in Britain. So very last question. What is the nature of your work? Oh, it's not the last question. Are you an academic? Are you working in practice? Are you working in policy? Uh, other? And then I'm, of course, very curious to go about the other. Anyone select an other? There are 21 who selected the other. So who wants to raise their hand? Sorry? What is the passion of the programming like NGO? Yeah. Yes. What about academic practitioners that do policy? They have to choose your focus, right? I mean, I think both academics are also working a bit in practice and doing policy, and it's also the other way around, right? Practitioners doing a bit of academic work, but the main focus. Fundraising. Sorry? Fundraising. Fundraising. So what are you what are you doing? Fundraising. Also fundraising. Okay. Okay. So again, a nice mix. Most of us work in either practice or academic, and as you rightly point out, there are all kinds of connections also between uh all these different Feels okay. Then my very last question to you: What are your expectations for this conference? What do you hope to get out of this conference? So networking and connects are big ones. Learning and knowledge. 
seems to be connected inspiration inspiration definitely Well, maybe we'll do another one on the very last day and then see whether. Well, I do hope you will find lots of inspiration that you will get to know many people at this conference. Also meet with friends, hopefully. And um, looking forward to uh, engaging with all of you during these couple of these next couple of days. Um, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a group photo in this room. But for that, what we need to do is to try to get as much as possible to the center of this room. And <laughs> 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 